Sometime, probably in the early 70s, the basement of the building next door to ours was turned into a cinema. Part of the internal communal garden, which was covered in weeds and puddles, was taken over by a low, windowless building. Under the roof of that building, there was a cinema hall, furnished with sky-blue folding cinema chairs. The roof became for me the scene of more action than the screen it was covering. The cinema roof was locked in between the backs of the surrounding five-story buildings, which were covered with kitchen windows. Behind the windows, grandmothers were cooking lunch and keeping an eye on the children who were in the garden or on the roof. The space of this urban box was also crisscrossed by double washing lines, stretched between two pulleys fixed on two opposite walls, very much like the laser beams protecting bank vaults in Jean-Claude Van Damme film. There were different ways to get onto the roof. You could climb onto the brick wall, separating our garden from another garden, where the Hungarian woman with long grey curly hair lived. From the brick wall, it was easy to get onto the roof. Another way was from the window of the military building, under which was the entrance and the box office of the cinema. It was a floor taller than our building, and my grandmother called it military because it housed senior military officers. She despised them because they carried shopping bags on the street while dressed in full uniform. At the back of the military building, there were small cubic kitchen balconies where the colonels and generals stood chopping onion and smoking and wearing only their vests and shorts. This was too much for my grandmother, whose father, she used to tell me a few times a day, had been an officer in the Tsar's army. From what I heard from her, I associated that army with waltzing, parquet and shiny boots. However, she had a cordial relationship with the officer's wife just opposite our flat, who, she said, was a former Serbian partisan. The best way to get onto the roof, however, was by climbing the giant mulberry tree in our garden. The tree trunk was quite far from the cinema building. It had long branches that leaned onto the roof. I would climb its fat trunk, grabbing its deep prehistoric wrinkles, race to the top and then down, taking a different route and ending up on the branch leveled with our fourth floor kitchen balcony, frightening my grandmother. Picking and eating white sticky mulberries, I would finally walk along the branch that leaned against the roof of the cinema. The roof was covered with dusty black asphalt paper, a perfect grip for my ketsuve, the cheap rubber and canvas Chinese boots that preceded trainers in Bulgaria. Everything was cheap then. There was another partisan who lived above the roof. She was a Bulgarian partisan, not married, and she did not have children. She was always very cross when we were too noisy on the roof. We learned from her that she did not have children because she had sacrificed herself. She had done it for us. So I learned two stories about the anti-fascist resistance. One was a story you could see in the cinema of handsome young men who used to blow up German supply trains and were always prepared to die, and who never revealed the names of their comrades, no matter how cruelly they were tortured by fat Bulgarian policemen or skinny German officers. The other story was about lady partisans, whose sacrifice we had to honor by not playing under their windows between 2 and 4 p.m. In fact, the whole country used to have a rest between 2 and 4 and it was rude to call people in their homes at that time. I was one of those inconsiderate children who were very noisy during these sacred two hours, 
that even I was careful not to kick a bow under the windows of former partisans and members of the party. I never understood, however, why the Bulgarian partisan lady did not share the washing line with the Serbian partisan lady. Their windows were at the perfect distance and a washing line could have taken exactly two big loads of weekend washing. Instead, the single Bulgarian partisan who had sacrificed her life for us shared a washing line with the single Hungarian lady with the cats, despite the obvious fact that the Hungarian lady was from a bourgeois background. The Serbian partisan shared a washing line with the family who also had a bourgeois background and who had a kitchen window on a diagonal with the window of the Hungarian lady with the cats. At that time, people were divided into several categories. The rarest one was enemies of the people. I don't remember meeting any real-life enemies of the people. They had been either liquidated or converted by the time the cinema was built. So the kitchen curtains around the cinema roof did not hide any of them, which probably was the reason why there was no risk in sharing a washing line with a neighbor you did not know. There were also active fighters against fascism and capitalism. These were the people whom you should not disturb between 2 and 4 p.m. And then there were ordinary comrades, the majority of the hundred or so families surrounding the roof. And there were citizens. The citizens were also not visible, because the word citizen was reserved for those who could not be comrades. In other words, criminals. Naturally, the criminals were in prison, so the washing lines mainly connected ordinary comrades and occasionally active fighters against fascism and capitalism. We did not have a double washing line stretched between two pulleys. We had a small balcony in front of our kitchen and another balcony in front of our only separate bedroom. The kitchen and the bedroom walls made an internal right angle, like the two neighboring walls of a shoebox. Instead of a double washing line on two pulleys, we had a fixed washing line that was stretched seven or eight times between the railings of the two balconies. That made me very jealous of all the families who had pulleys. We shared our washing lines with the tenants who lived in our only bedroom. Sometime in the 50s, before I was born, somebody had assessed the housing needs of my family and decided that they had an excess living area and had sent them tenants, a divorced mother and her teenage daughter. They lived in our bedroom and used half of our combined loo and bathroom for a kitchen. That's why we shared our washing line with them. We had enough room, however, because my grandfather died two weeks after I was born. Probably he wanted just to see me and then make some room for the expanding family. We were lucky because my father had studied engineering in Vienna. Because of this dubious past, he was not allowed to travel abroad and he spent more time with us. As an engineer, he was quite good at building plywood partitions and screens so that he, my mother, my brother, my grandmother and I were all comfortably accommodated in the previously adjoined double drawing room and dining room of our Sofia flat. He even made a tall bar table in the kitchen, probably inspired by some of the rare Italian films that slipped into the country. My grandmother used the table to chop tomatoes and onion for her unrivaled stuffed peppers while keeping an eye on me and my brother on the cinema roof or in the branches of the mulberry tree. Soon after my father made the bar table, our tenants left and my brother, my grandmother and I moved to the bedroom. Now my grandmother could hang the washing freely from both sides, the kitchen balcony and the balcony of the bedroom, which 40 years earlier 
she had decorated as a dream bedroom for herself and my grandfather and painted with shiny pale green car paint. Communism collapsed almost overnight. People, including many, who were silently dreaming about a world where you could safely shout on the street, the mayor is a pig, were surprised. It took them exactly seven days. On the eighth day, more than a hundred thousand people gathered in the center of Sofia to shout, bring down the Communist Party, and anything else they wanted to shout. When they didn't shout, they were jumping up and down. That is how one of the most popular chants of the new democracy was born. If you don't jump, you're a cop, referring to the secret service agents who are supposed to be everywhere. There were many demonstrators in their 70s and 80s who abandoned the kitchens that faced their backyards and their double washing lines to join the largest voluntary street gathering in the history of the country. They did not object to the jumping democracy test. This sudden rush of historical adrenaline and the November chill were producing body movements that would have easily inspired Michael Jackson for a sequence of thriller. My grandmother died long before that day, when I was in the army. I was wondering whether she would have had tears in her eyes when people poured into the streets to shout. The last time I saw tears in her eyes was one afternoon when her body, frozen by a heavy stroke, was installed in front of the family television and the state station was showing La Traviata. The telegram arrived two days after her death. I arrived the day after her funeral, which had to take place strictly two days after her death. She didn't wait for me, unlike my grandfather, who waited for my birth 19 years earlier. My mother was now fully in charge of the kitchen and the washing lines. I was not living with my parents anymore, despite the vast free space left after the death of my grandmother. So I could only watch the changes in the backyard during my weekly visits home. I would get quick glimpses of the cinema roof as if I were looking at random frames of an old film against a bare light bulb hanging from the kitchen ceiling. The children had disappeared from the roof. The windows of the Hungarian lady were replaced by new double glazing PVC windows, something that usually meant that the lonely occupant of the flat had died. The mulberry tree collapsed under its own age and weight. I saw one day that the long massive branch, one third of its majestic body, had split and fallen to the ground. Then the fallen branch disappeared. A few months later, the rest of the tree had gone. One day the cinema was closed. Then it turned into shops and restaurants. Spherical windows and more air conditioning towers appeared on the cinema roof. Grandmothers died. Younger families with children went abroad and most of the washing lines connecting people were replaced by tumble dryers. Now the roof is the home of happy homeless cats. They didn't have much chance of leading such a quiet existence in my time.